What is Shinto and what are its origins? Shinto derives from two Chinese words Shen, meaning deity, and Deo, meaning way. The Japanese reading of the Chinese expression comes out Kami no Michi, the path of the Kami. Since at least several centuries BCE, the Japanese have acknowledged the sacred presence and power of numinous beings called Kami, high or superior beings. Until about the middle of the 6th century CE, the Japanese people evidently did not think of their ancient religious traditions as a separate system. So organically integrated were those traditions with their entire culture. And heritage that worship of the kami was largely assumed as the Japanese way. Only with the arrival of Buddhism, called in Japanese the way of the Buddha, Butsudu. Did it become necessary to give the indigenous beliefs and practices a name to distinguish them from this imported tradition? Unlike many other major traditions, Shinto had neither a founder nor a single foundational figure who represents concrete historical origins. In a sense, Shinto is as old as Japan itself, somewhat the way Hinduism is as old as India. At its core, the way of the kami enshrines profound insights into the sacred character of all created nature. Shinto calls people to a deep awareness of the divine presence suffusing all things. To the challenge of personal and corporate responsibility for the stewardship of the world that is home. To unending gratitude for all that is good. And to a willingness to seek purification and forgiveness for humanly inevitable but avoidable lapses. Observe worshippers at a Shinto shrine as Buddhism has temples, Shinto has shrines and there can be little. Doubt of the sincere devotion that moves so many people to prayer and ritual expression of their beliefs. What is Shinto and what are its origins? Shinto derives from two Chinese words Shen, meaning deity, and Deo, meaning way. The Japanese reading of the Chinese expression comes out Kami no Michi, the path of the Kami. Since at least several centuries BCE, the Japanese have acknowledged the sacred presence and power of numinous beings called Kami, high or superior beings. Until about the middle of the 6th century CE, the Japanese people evidently did not think of their ancient religious traditions as a separate system. So organically integrated were those traditions with their entire culture. And heritage that worship of the kami was largely assumed as the Japanese way. Only with the arrival of Buddhism, called in Japanese the way of the Buddha, Butsudu. Did it become necessary to give the indigenous beliefs and practices a name to distinguish them from this imported tradition? Unlike many other major traditions, Shinto had neither a founder nor a single foundational figure who represents concrete historical origins. In a sense, Shinto is as old as Japan itself, somewhat the way Hinduism is as old as India. At its core, the way of the kami enshrines profound Insights into the sacred character of all created nature. 
Shinto calls people to a deep awareness of the Divine Presence suffusing all things. To the challenge of personal and corporate responsibility for the stewardship of the world that is home. To unending gratitude for all that is good. And to a willingness to seek purification and forgiveness for humanly inevitable but avoidable lapses. Observe worshippers at a Shinto shrine as Buddhism has temples, Shinto has shrines and there can be little. Doubt of the sincere devotion that moves so many people to prayer and ritual expression of their beliefs. What were the earliest Shinto sacred texts? Two 8th century documents are Shinto's foundational texts. These are among the youngest of the major religious tradition's primary works. Unlike many other sacred texts, they are not considered to have been divinely written even though their subject matter is of divine origin. In other words, these scriptures are not considered divine communication as such, but communication about things divine. The records of ancient matters, or Kojiki, dates to 712 CE. Composed by a courtier named Yasumaro, its three volumes deal with events beginning with the creation of the Japanese islands and people and continuing down to 628 CE. Exegetes have authored scores of major commentaries, called Kojikadin, in relatively recent times. The 30-volume Chronicles of Japan, called Nihongi as well as Nianjoki, was completed in 720 CE. About three times the length of the Kojiki, the Chronicles also recount the ancient cosmogonic myth, though in a less detailed fashion. Greater detail about subsequent imperial history includes events up to 697 CE. These two texts enjoyed special prominence after the 17th century. When a school of Shinto studies called National Learning, Kokugaku, set out to probe the sources for the essence of being Japanese that they communicate. These primary texts are so important because they record the history of the imperial family and legitimate its authority by establishing its divine lineage. What were the earliest Shinto sacred texts? Two 8th century documents are Shinto's foundational texts. These are among the youngest of the major religious tradition's primary works. Unlike many other sacred texts, they are not considered to have been divinely written even though their subject matter is of divine origin. In other words, these scriptures are not considered divine communication as such, but communication about things divine. The records of ancient matters, or Kojiki, dates to 712 CE. Composed by a courtier named Yasumaro, its three volumes deal with events beginning with the creation of the Japanese islands and people and continuing down to 628 CE. Exegetes have authored scores of major commentaries, called Kojikadin, in relatively recent times. 
The 30 volume Chronicles of Japan, called Nihongi as well as Nianjoki, was completed in 720 CE. About three times the length of the Kojiki, the Chronicles also. Recount the ancient cosmogonic myth, though in a less detailed fashion. Greater detail about subsequent imperial history includes events up to 697 CE. These two texts enjoyed special prominence after the 17th century. When a school of Shinto studies called National Learning, Kokugaku, set out to probe the sources for the essence of being Japanese that they communicate. These primary texts are so important because they record the history of the imperial family and legitimate its authority by establishing its divine lineage. What other early scriptures are especially important for Shinto practitioners? Is there a Shinto scriptural canon? Scholars refer to the various sacred texts collectively as Shinton, texts of the deities. But although they generally agree on the importance of a certain set of works, there has never been an official process of canonization by which representatives of the tradition have formally declared certain texts as definitive. Here are the most important of the classical documents. From the early 8th century, the Fudoki, records of wind and earth. Provided data about very early religious rituals from major shrines. The early 9th century Kogoshwe, 807, or gleaning of ancient words commented on previous documents in an attempt to legitimate the Imbe family against their enemies, the Nakatomi clan. The Manyoshu, collection of countless leaves, anthologizes a large selection of 7th and 8th century Japanese poetry of various genres. Some Shinto scholars have insisted that these poems represent the purest form of Japanese literary expression. First published in 927, the NG Shiki includes a collection of more than two dozen prayer texts. A work called the Kyujiki, also Sendai Kyuji Hangi, or Records of Ancient Happenings bears the date 620 but was probably contrived as late as the 9th century to compete with the similar sounding Kojiki in antiquity and authority. It amounts to what some traditions might call an apocryphal work not what it claims to be. But still full of valuable material. Finally, a group of 13th century texts called the Five Shinto Scriptures. Shinto Gobusho, emphasize the antiquity of Japan's Shinto heritage. 17th century scholars who studied these texts as prime examples of Japanese culture and values went on to spearhead the National Learning School of Thought. What other early scriptures are especially important for Shinto practitioners? Is there a Shinto scriptural canon? Scholars refer to the various sacred texts collectively as Shinton, texts of the deities. 
but although they generally agree on the importance of a certain set of works. There has never been an official process of canonization by which representatives of the tradition have formally declared certain texts as definitive. Here are the most important of the classical documents. From the early 8th century, the Feudoki, records of wind and earth. Provided data about very early religious rituals from major shrines. The early 9th century Kogoshwe, 807, or gleaning of ancient words commented on previous. Documents in an attempt to legitimate the Imbe family against their enemies, the Nakatami clan. The Manyoshu, collection of countless leaves. Anthologizes a large selection of 7th and 8th century Japanese poetry of various genres. Some Shinto scholars have insisted that these poems represent the purest form of Japanese literary expression. First published in 927, the Enji Shiki includes a collection of more than two dozen prayer texts. A work called the Kyujiki, also Sendai Kyuji Hangi. Or Records of Ancient Happenings bears the date 620 but was probably contrived as late as the 9th century to compete with the similar sounding Kojiki in antiquity and authority. It amounts to what some traditions might call an apocryphal work not what it claims to be. But still full of valuable material. Finally, a group of 13th century texts called the Five Shinto Scriptures. Shinto Gobusho, emphasize the antiquity of Japan's Shinto heritage. 17th century scholars who studied these texts as prime examples of Japanese culture and values went on to spearhead the National Learning School of Thought. What does the term dual Shinto mean? Dual, or Ryobu, two-sided, Shinto arose out of the early interaction between Shinto theology and Buddhist thinking newly imported from China. Some use the term Ryobu Shigo, dual compromise, to describe the resulting syncretism. Some accounts describe the developments this way. In 715 CE a Shinto shrine annexed a Buddhist temple. Twenty years later a smallpox epidemic created a crisis. To which the emperor responded by commissioning the colossal great Buddha, Daibutsu, at Nara's Todeji temple. At the same time, the ruler dispatched the Buddhist patriarch Gijitu. ISE shrine to seek the blessing of Amaterasu, the Shinto sun goddess. Gyuji secured a favorable oracle, and the next night the emperor had a dream in which Amaterasu identified herself as the Mahayana Buddha of infinite light, Varokana. This laid the groundwork for further identification of the Various kami as alter egos of various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In 750, an image of the Shinto war kami, Hachiman, was transported from its shrine at USA on the island of Kyushu, just south of the main Japanese island. Honshu, to Todeji in Nara so that the kami might pay respects to the Daibutsu. 
Hachiman thereafter remained in a special shrine at Todeji. Where he became the guardian kami of Todeji temple. Thus did a Shinto kami come to protect the teachings of the Buddha. This account reflects an interpretation formulated during the 9th century by teachers of a new esoteric school of Buddhism called Shinjin. As always, this theological accommodation had its political implications and set the stage for many years of Buddhist growth and royal patronage. From then on until 1868, Dual Shinto was the dominant form of Shinto. With the Meiji restoration of imperial power came increasing pressure from Shinto scholars. To purge the tradition of all Chinese influences, including of course Buddhism and Confucianism. Both of which had by turns exerted considerable pull at court for many years. What does the term dual Shinto mean? Dual, or Ryobu, two-sided, Shinto arose out of the early interaction between Shinto theology and Buddhist thinking newly imported from China. Some use the term Ryobu Shigo, dual compromise, to describe the resulting syncretism. Some accounts describe the developments this way. In 715 CE a Shinto shrine annexed a Buddhist temple. Twenty years later a smallpox epidemic created a crisis. To which the emperor responded by commissioning the colossal great Buddha, Daibutsu, at Nara's Todeji temple. At the same time, the ruler dispatched the Buddhist patriarch Gijitu. ISE shrine to seek the blessing of Amaterasu, the Shinto sun goddess. Gyuji secured a favorable oracle, and the next night the emperor had a dream in which Amaterasu identified herself as the Mahayana Buddha of Infinite Light, Varokana. This laid the groundwork for further identification of the various kami as alter egos of various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In 750, an image of the Shinto war kami, Hachiman, was transported from its shrine at USA on the island of Kyushu, just south of the main Japanese island. Hanshu, to Todeji in Nara so that the kami might pay respects to the Daibutsu. Hachiman thereafter remained in a special shrine at Todeji, where he became the guardian kami of Todeji temple. Thus did a Shinto kami come to protect the teachings of the Buddha. This account reflects an interpretation formulated during the 9th century by teachers of a new esoteric school of Buddhism called Shinjin. As always, this theological accommodation had its political implications and set the stage for many years of Buddhist growth and royal patronage. From then on until 1868, dual Shinto was the dominant form of Shinto. With the Meiji restoration of imperial power came increasing pressure from Shinto scholars. To purge the tradition of all Chinese influences, including of course Buddhism and Confucianism. Both of which had by turns exerted considerable pull at court for many years.
Who was Matteo Ricci and what was his role in China? Matteo Ricci, 1552-1610, was an Italian Jesuit missionary who opened China to Roman Catholic evangelization. He was the best-known Jesuit and European in China prior to the 20th century. Born at Mace Reda in 1552, Ricci went to Rome in 1568 to study law. In 1571 he entered the Society of Jesus. After studying mathematics and geography at a Roman college. He set out for Goa in 1577 and was ordained there in 1580. In 1582 he was dispatched to Macau and started to learn Chinese. In 1601, Ricci made his way to Beijing and received a warm welcome from the emperor. This imperial favor provided Ricci with an opportunity to meet the leading officials and literati in Beijing. Some of whom later became Christian converts. Ricci obtained a settlement with an allowance for subsistence in Beijing. After which his reputation among the Chinese increased. Besides the missionary and scientific work. From 1596 on he was also superior of the missions, which in 1605 numbered 17. When he died in 1610, he was granted a burial place in Beijing. Some of the outstanding Chinese literati with whom Ricci had contact later became his converts. Including the famous scholar officials HSU Kuang Chi, Li Qi Tsao, and Yang T Ing Yun. Ricci's writings include about 20 titles, mostly in Chinese. Ranging from religious and scientific works to treatises on friendship and local memory. The most famous of these are the Mapamondo and the True Idea of God. Is there any further symbolism attached to the structure of the calendar? Each month is divided into 10-day periods, six of those in turn considered a special time period. And six of those in turn equaling a full year. In addition, each year is divided into 24 climatic periods called breaths or nodes. Described by such phrases as full of snow or clear and bright. Every year, month, day, and hour are further identified by a combination of ten heavenly stems and twelve earthly branches, the monthly or zodiacal symbols. The ten heavenly stems are associated with colors. Two stems with each of the five symbolic colors, azure, red, yellow, white, black which are in turn linked to the four directions and center as well as to the five elements. Branches and stems are both primarily numerical designators. But each also bears important symbolic connotations. If you match one stem with one branch for succeeding years. S1 slash B1, S2 slash B2. S1 slash B11, S2 slash B12, S3 slash B1, and so on, you end up back at the beginning after 60 years. In this system, only odd numbered stems combine with odd numbered branches. Even numbered with even numbered. We are currently in the 60 year cycle that began in 1984.
The result of all this calculation is an extremely detailed system of pinpointing special times according to a host of definitive characteristics. Each event occurring on Earth has its heavenly parallel. For every conceivable type of human behavior there is an auspicious moment. The calendar has thus been not merely a way of keeping track of times for religious observances. But a kind of temporal map for negotiating the cosmos as well. Each year, during the ninth lunar month. Imperial officials set up the liturgical calendar for the year to come. What are the principal Confucian and CIT rites of passage? Confucian tradition prescribes a full range of very detailed ritual procedures to be observed for various family. As well as a few public, occasions. They differ from rites of passage in many other traditions in. That they generally do not assume an overtly religious form. Confucian teaching places enormous emphasis on ritualized attentiveness to every detail of daily family life. All of that occurs within the larger presumed context of life under heaven and in a society that is at least potentially just and harmonious. In pre-modern times, Many Chinese practiced rites of initiation for young women and men alike. Families conferred on young men a hat and a name symbolizing maturity. Young women received some new clothes and had their hair done specially. More recently, Chinese social custom has linked these rituals to marriage. Now considered the primary sign of adulthood. Do Confucians believe in an afterlife? Confucius did not focus on life after death as though it were the ultimate standard against which to measure the success of a life on earth. With the majority of his fellow Chinese the teacher shared the conviction that biological death did not signal a definitive end to life. Death did not mean annihilation and loss in some great void beyond the grave. Confucius clearly believed in some form of spiritual survival. And in the ongoing presence of those who have departed this life. Hence the importance of ancestor veneration. But like the Buddha, Confucius, and his disciples chose not to speculate about possible celestial or infernal post-mortem scenarios. Daoism and CCT would offer ample options in that regard. He neither denied nor affirmed any particular views. Confucius was convinced that human beings understood far too little of life. Here and now to wasted planning for a hereafter they understood even less. When classical Confucian sources talk about heaven, therefore, they do not have in mind anything like a realm of eternal reward for those who die in a state of righteousness. Heaven is merely a name for the highest spiritual presence of which human beings are aware.
Where does academic regalia come from? Early every student who graduates from high school or college makes a passing connection with Confucian tradition. Academic robes with their wide flowing sleeves are at least vaguely similar to those worn by Confucian ritual leaders even today in places like Taiwan and Korea when they celebrate the master's birthday or honor royal ancestors. But one look at the headgear and the viewer knows instantly where the so-called mortar board came from. Principal participants in important Confucian rituals sport large flat rectangular boards worn with flat sides. Rather than corners, as in common graduation practice now, facing the wearer's front, back, and sides. Confucian mortar boards outdid modern ones in ornamentation. With rows of tassels all along the front and back edges. Does the shaman have a place in Confucianism and CIT? Shamans played an important role in Chinese religious history long before the time of Confucius. They have retained a place in Daoism and CCT, functioning as guides to the spirit world. But since Confucian teaching is far more concerned with how things are going in the outer world of ordinary human affairs, there have never been Confucian shamans as such. Shamans have generally been associated with folk and popular beliefs. As an important ingredient in CIT, Confucianism has often had a more aristocratic tone. However, some functions anciently connected with shamanism have had continuous importance throughout much of Chinese history for CIT as well as popular religion. Confucian literati and their imperial patrons alike have regularly consulted diviners, specialists in feng shui and astrology. For help in determining auspicious times and places for momentous events and structures. What are the major festivities historically associated with CIT? Each year on the day before the winter solstice, the emperor and his retinue visited the Temple of Heaven for an elaborate event. When paying homage to heaven and earth, the emperor would perform special gestures of humility by kneeling three times and prostrating himself nine times. When he sacrificed to other powers, such as the sun, the moon and the gods with power over the forces of nature, the emperor did not perform those rituals of self-abasement. At the Forbidden City's Hall of Supreme Harmony, major sacred events included the enthronement of a new emperor, royal weddings, an event held every ten years called the Great Anniversary. Announcement of results of civil service examinations, and celebrations of the winter solstice and new year. In the Hall of Middle Harmony, the Emperor formulated decrees to be made public in royal temples at all the various seasonal festivities. Imperial officials designated by the Emperor, or local administrators in the case of smaller events. 
took care of the regular agriculturally significant occasions throughout the country. Has meditation been an important ritual activity for Confucians? Confucian tradition has generally emphasized the need for a calm, contemplative approach to life. Few individuals can develop the habit of reflection without engaging deliberately in practices designed to facilitate that habit. Meditation has not occupied as prominent a position in Confucian. Spirituality as it has in Chinese Buddhism, but it is important nevertheless. Confucians who engage in solitary or group meditation usually sit on small stools. Rather than on the floor in the lotus posture, as many Buddhists do. When Confucians meditate, they reflect on the underlying propriety and order of the universe. Cultivation of the ethical self for the purpose of Contributing more conscientiously to society is the goal. Classical Confucian and Neo-Confucian writers describe Meditation as quiet sitting and abiding in reverence. Unlike Zen meditation, Confucian meditation has a distinctly ethical emphasis. Some authors say the goal of meditation is to make a place in one's mind for the human beings who constitute one's own community family, friends, associates. Not unlike a process of free association. This form of meditation gathers whatever comes to mind and allows it all to sift and settle naturally. Settled nature is the goal. A state in which the meditator is free from the agitation that arises from disordered relationships. Confucian meditation may sound quite unstructured. But it requires constant mental and emotional discipline. A meditator must be alert to abstract notions that distract from concrete ethical concerns. For it is often much easier to drift off into speculation than to confront life as one is actually living it. What signs or symbols distinguish Confucian and CIT ritual specialists? Even today, leaders of Confucian rituals are typically also government officials. When they function as ritual specialists, they don the garments once worn by representatives of the imperial household and administration. As for CIT, since there is no longer any official imperial religious worship, there are no longer CIT ritual specialists. Prior to 1911, however, CIT ritualists, from the emperor on down to the humblest assistant, simply wore the garments that signified their respective bureaucratic ranks and offices. In this case, the literati did double duty as custodians of both civil and religious ritual. For especially important events, officials wore various garments known generically as dragon robes. Each decorated with emblems of the wearer's administrative rank. Imperial robes worn by the ruler during rituals were once festooned with an array of symbolic decorative motifs known collectively as the Twelve Ornaments, or symbols. 
symbolizing heaven and its wisdom were the sun, shown with a three-legged raven inside its red disc. The blue or green moon surrounding a hair grinding. The elixir of immortality with mortar and pestle, and the constellations. Images of mountains symbolized earth and strength. Standing for all living things, the dragon symbolized resilience. The pheasant, culture, and literary accomplishment. In images of bronze ritual vessel celebrants saw filial devotion. In cereal grains abundant harvest, in flame illumination, and in the water plant purity. Along with the mountains, the latter four also corresponded with the five elements. Finally, the Fu, a geometric form meaning good fortune, and the axe. Referred respectively to the imperial prerogatives of judgment and punishment. When displayed together, the twelve were done in combinations. Of the five symbolic colors associated with the five directions. None but the emperor's ritual vestments could depict all twelve ornaments. Since they constituted a symbolic summary of the whole cosmos. What is meant by the term rectification of names? If Confucius were here today he would surely be aghast at the way. Inflated language seems to have taken over ordinary conversation. I was so tired I was literally dead on my feet. No you weren't, he might say. Drop the literally and. Your expression will have far more impact, even though your surrounding culture insists that more is better. He would be amazed to hear restaurant staff introduce themselves as your food and beverage counselor. Or hear store cashiers and stockers identified as sales associates and inventory specialists. But Confucius would worry less about such trivial matters than about the very same deep social issues he agonized over in his own time. When a man fails to show respect to his parents, do not call him a son. If he fails to guide his children, he is unworthy to be called a father. If a woman does not attend to her family faithfully, one can hardly call her a wife or mother. If a man is unfaithful to his wife, do not call him a husband. Of greatest political import is his insistence that no unjust ruler deserves the name emperor. Beneath this apparently nitpicking criticism Confucius was getting at a profound truth, over the long haul. Imprecise speech allows injustice to go unnoticed because it can be hidden behind acceptable names. Euphemism can erode one's sense of right and wrong and desensitize a person to violence. Eventually we persuade ourselves that misspeaking is not a lie. Or that stealing is nothing more than the redistribution of wealth. Confucius believed that language matters because it not only reflects, but can even change, the way we think. What is the principal Confucian virtue? Behind all the other virtues, what makes a good Confucian tick is filial devotion or xiao. 
The Chinese term is composed of sun with old placed above it. Confucius taught that all other moral virtue, and indeed civilization itself, flows from filial devotion. As a bare minimum, one should do no harm to one's parents. Filial devotion culminates in doing one's family proud. Traditional texts go into great detail about how one ought to treat parents. Summarizing ideal behavior in five duties, reverence always, joyful service, solicitude for ailing parents. Sincere grief at a parent's death, and proper ritual veneration thereafter. Lack of filial devotion was a most serious offense. Individuals could be put to death for cursing their elders. Filial devotion was the very bedrock of social order, a fundamental acknowledgement of authority on the family level. Without which there could be no exercise of authority in society at large. Chinese tradition regards society as built on the family. Sons and daughters do not go out into the world as they reach maturity. Rather than leaving the nest, they invest themselves in the family. Knowing that their children will do the same. Only in that way can the foundations of society as a whole remain firm. What attitudes toward pilgrimage are important in Confucianism and CIT? Confucian teaching generally did not promote the popular practice of pilgrimage. Associated as it was with Taoism and Buddhism. A larger concern had to do with the social and political implications of devotional travel. Many Confucians considered pilgrimage a potential threat to the stability of society. Anthropologists talk about the experience of liminality as an essential part of pilgrimage. Pilgrims step out of their accustomed social roles, leaving behind the rules duties, and responsibilities of ordinary daily life. They become liminal in that they step across a threshold, limen in Latin, into another way of being and thinking, if only temporarily. For people who regard their function as maintaining social order, the prospect of throngs of pilgrims heading out across the countryside in hope of miracles or magic naturally poses a threat. Enthusiastic crowds are prey to demagogues and can turn into unruly mobs. Still, a parallel to devotional pilgrimage developed among Confucians on a smaller scale. Confucius himself became a model of the itinerant scholar. Traveling from one province to another in search of disciples and patrons. Later Confucians often followed his example. Eventually the places in which these Confucian exemplars had lived and taught began to attract visitors. Not surprisingly, the tomb of Confucius in Shandong became a goal for Confucian pilgrims who were generally in search not of miracles, but of inspiration in the struggle to live a good life. In general, it appears that the tradition of family members caring for ancestral graves may have been significant in preventing burial places from becoming pilgrimage goals. Mountains were also important destinations for China's literati. There. One could contemplate most abundantly nature's sacred beauty. 
there, too, was the incomparable source of poetic inspiration. Is there a distinctively Confucian ethic? A Confucian formulation of the universal golden rule at first strikes the ear as rather negative and passive. Do not do to others what you do not want done to you. But the Confucian ethic turns out to be overwhelmingly active and positive. Because of its emphasis on cultivating the natural human capacity for virtue, the master's positive approach revolves around several key concepts. First and foremost is Li, principle, or propriety. Consisting of a whole range of directives for human behavior. Much of Li arises from the customs that embody the spirit of community. When people can rely on propriety in all relationships. As enshrined in time-honored practice, they experience assurance and freedom in their relationships. Confucius gathered a huge catalog of social rituals, not out of antiquarian curiosity, but as a way of preserving what he considered the best of tradition. Ritual propriety is not meant to confine, but to give a sense of lightness and freedom. Without Li, he thought, there can be no justice, no morality. For a society without propriety has no foundation in respect. Of equal importance is the notion of Shu, reciprocity in interpersonal relationships. Reciprocity is essential to putting Li into action. For it governs the five principal human relationships and the ten associated virtues. In the father-son relationship, the father must cultivate kindness, the son reverence. The elder brother must deal gently with his younger brother, who responds with respect. A mutuality of faithfulness and obedience should characterize husband-wife relationships. Let all elders be considerate of those younger, and expect deference in return. Finally, a ruler must strive to treat subjects with benevolence and benefit from their loyalty as a result. What kind of calendar do Confucians and CIT observe? whether Deist, CCT, Buddhist, or Confucian. All Chinese have historically acknowledged the same overall reckoning of time. Official Confucian and CIT events were traditionally set by a board of astrology and promulgated by a ministry of rites. In overall structure, the Chinese lunar calendar consists of 12 months of 29 or 30 days. Since the time between new moons is about 29 and a half days. The lunar year dovetails with the solar, with the intercalation of an extra month. Approximately every 6 years or when 5 additional days per year total 30. Reckoning began around 2637 BCE, so that the year 2000 marks the year 4637. Each of the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac is associated with a particular quality or event and gives its name to every 12th year. Beginning with the rat, industry and prosperity, and proceeding in order through ox, spring planting, tiger. 
valor, hair, longevity, dragon, power and good fortune, snake, cunning, horse, perseverance, sheep. Filial piety, or goat, monkey, health, rooster, protection, dog, fidelity, and pig, home and family. The year 2000 is the year of the dragon, 2001 that of the snake, 2002 that of the horse, and so on. Five full cycles, each named after one of the five elements, wood, fire, earth. Metal and water, equal 60 years, an important interval for ritual purposes. Major annual markers are the winter, maximum yin, and summer, maximum yang. Solstices and vernal and autumnal equinoxes when yin and yang are in balance. During each month, the most important times are the moments of new and full moon. What other early scriptures are especially important for Shinto practitioners? Is there a Shinto scriptural canon? Scholars refer to the various sacred texts collectively as Shinton, texts of the deities. But although they generally agree on the importance of a certain set of works, there has never been an official process of canonization by which representatives of the tradition have formally declared certain texts as definitive. Here are the most important of the classical documents. From the early 8th century, the Fudoki, records of wind and earth. Provided data about very early religious rituals from major shrines. The early 9th century Kogoshwe, 807, or gleaning of ancient words commented on previous. Documents in an attempt to legitimate the Imbe family against their enemies, the Nakatomi clan. The Manyoshu, collection of countless leaves, anthologizes a large selection of 7th and 8th century Japanese poetry of various genres. Some Shinto scholars have insisted that these poems represent the purest form of Japanese literary expression. First published in 927, the NG Shiki includes a collection of more than two dozen prayer texts. A work called the Kyujiki, also Sendai Kyuji Hangi. Or Records of Ancient Happenings bears the date 620 but was probably contrived as late as the 9th. Century to compete with the similar sounding Kojiki in antiquity and authority. It amounts to what some traditions might call an apocryphal work not what it claims to be. But still full of valuable material. Finally, a group of 13th century texts called the Five Shinto Scriptures. Shinto Gobusho, emphasize the antiquity of Japan's Shinto heritage. 17th century scholars who studied these texts as prime examples of Japanese culture and values went on to spearhead the National Learning School of Thought. What is the basic Confucian concept of appropriate moral leadership?
Confucius believed that order was essential for bringing out the best in human beings. He and his disciples rejected the early deist notions that all things work for the best if only people learn the ways of nature and that there is no need for government or military force or oppressive laws. In Confucius' view government was essential, and that almost always required bureaucratic structures. But he believed the external trappings had to be supported by a foundation of example rather than coercion. No one can bring about the good society by force of will. One can only foster appropriate government by creating an environment of propriety, reciprocity, and good music. Yes, good music. Law, he believed, can erode moral values because people often prefer to act a certain way merely to escape punishment. The example of a great leader is preferable. For it instills a sense of healthy shame that leads people to seek improvement. Confucius was a realist, however, and conceded that law was often a practical necessity. What he wanted for the people most of all was the sense of confidence that can grow when people feel prosperous and educated. A good leader knows how to bring out the best in his people and how to wield authority deftly. But as a concession to the vast differences among human beings, government needs levels of power some can lead. Some can support a leader, some can follow but may not understand why they ought to do so. A leader knows how to cultivate conditions conducive to the betterment of society by tapping the roots of human resources rather than waiting until the plant is fully grown and incapable of nurturance. What were the earliest Shinto sacred texts? Two 8th century documents are Shinto's foundational texts. These are among the youngest of the major religious tradition's primary works. Unlike many other sacred texts, they are not considered to have been divinely written even though their subject matter is of divine origin. In other words, these scriptures are not considered divine communication as such, but communication about things divine. The records of ancient matters, or Kojiki, dates to 712 CE. Composed by a courtier named Yasumuro, its three volumes deal with events beginning with the creation of the Japanese islands and people and continuing down to 628 CE. Exegetes have authored scores of major commentaries, called Kojikadin, in relatively recent times. The 30-volume Chronicles of Japan, called Nihongi as well as Nianchoki, was completed in 720 CE. About three times the length of the Kojiki, the chronicles also recount the ancient cosmogonic myth, though in a less detailed fashion. Greater detail about subsequent imperial history includes events up to 697 CE. These two texts enjoyed special prominence after the 17th century. When a school of Shinto studies called National Learning, Kokyagaku, set out to probe the sources for the essence of being Japanese that they communicate. These primary texts are so important because they record the history of the 
imperial family and legitimate its authority by establishing its divine lineage. What is the human ideal in Confucianism? Confucian teaching describes the epitome of the ideal society as the superior person, Jun Zi. That means an individual who arrives at a high level of personal development through self discipline and inquiry. The superior person values justice more highly than profit and prefers to be quiet and serene rather than vulgar and ungenial. Cultivating a dignified manner, the superior person nevertheless avoids arrogance. Such a person looks first to his or her personal shortcomings rather than blaming others for their lack of understanding or appreciation. It is said that the way of the superior person is a lengthy journey that begins from right here. Five constant virtues characterize the superior person, self-respect. Generosity, sincerity, responsibility, and openness to others. Expanding on the earlier teaching of Confucius. Meng Zi taught that fully developed human life begins with four principles. Compassion leads to true humanity, shame leads to righteousness. Reverence and respect to propriety, and a sense of moral value to wisdom. Behind the notion of the superior person lies a deep-seated conviction of human potential for almost unlimited moral growth. Could you describe an example of an annual CIT ritual occasion in greater detail? At the Temple of Heaven in Beijing, a major event occurred at the winter solstice. Preparations commenced two months in advance. With five days to go, authorities inspected the animals to be offered. The next day they prepared the hall in which the emperor would spend a day in spiritual preparation. And the day after that the emperor began his abstinence. A procession made its way from the forbidden city to the temple. Commoners taking care not to look at the royal person as he passed by. The emperor spent that day and night in the so-called Hall of Abstinence. A large complex to the west of the main north-south axis and about halfway between the altar. Of heaven to the south and the hall of harvest prayer at the north of the compound. He bathed ritually and fasted for a day. Later emperors often prepared in the forbidden city itself. Two days before the solstice. Ritualists made final preparation of all ceremonial objects for the emperor's review. The day before the solstice, the emperor left the hall of abstinence and proceeded to the altar of heaven to honor Shangdi and his own royal forebears with incense and bowing, and then returned the hall of abstinence. Early the next day, he began a nine part ceremony. At the round altar of heaven, where his ancestors' spirit tablets were arrayed. Animals were sacrificed and he paid obeisance to the ancestors. Offerings included silk and jade as well as the sacrificial meats. 
to music and dancing, he presented wine to Shangdi and the spirits in the first of three such offerings. After the emperor bade the sacred presences farewell he withdrew to an observation dais. While officials consigned the offerings to a furnace. The ceremonies ended with the emperor exiting by the south gate and returning to the forbidden city. Have there been any Confucian mystics? Scholars of the history of religion rarely describe the Confucian tradition as a wellspring of mystical spirituality. But several important figures, particularly among the Neo-Confucians, spoke a language reminiscent of some of the great monistic mystics of other traditions. Zhu Xi, a leading light in the Neo-Confucian school of principle, saw in the practice of meditation a way of becoming one with cosmic harmony. One could draw instructive parallels between traditional descriptions of this type of meditation and of certain qualities of the sage, and characteristics of nature mystics in other traditions. In Zhu Xi's view, silent sitting promised the realistic possibility of experiencing unity with all things and all people. Wang Yangming, a later exponent of the Neo-Confucian school of mind, spoke of realizing one's true self in a meditative quest for enlightenment. He identified cosmic principle, Li, with the mind. So that discovery of the true self meant discovering the ultimate reality. Some discern parallels between Wang's mysticism and that of the German mystic Meister Eckhart, C. 1260-1327 CE. What regular or annual observances have been part of Confucian tradition? For many centuries Confucian celebrated with large feasts in the Master's honor at both the vernal and autumnal equinoxes. Corresponding with the second and eighth lunar months. During the fourth of the night's five watches. Celebrants paid homage to Confucius' ancestors and then moved to the central memorial hall at sunrise. Arrayed carefully across the entire main courtyard were row upon row of participants. Arranged according to rank, with imperial bureaucrats along the sides and six groupings of students in the center. Before and within the memorial hall the offerings and sacrificial animals were arranged. These included a roll of silk, vessels full of wine, soup, and various foods and a ritually slaughtered ox flanked by a pig and a lamb. A lengthy order of ceremony included specific offerings of each item. First to Confucius and then to the other sages enshrined in the main hall. This was accompanied by profound bowing and prostration, and songs of praise. A full classical Chinese orchestra punctuated by booming drum beats marked changes in the action. In addition to those semi-annual festivities, smaller semi-monthly observances included offerings to the spirit of Confucius at each new and full moon. In Korea, at the spring and autumn equinoxes, 
Confucians honor both Korean and Chinese sages at the Confucian University's shrine. Have there been any important Confucian reformers? Wang Yangming, 1472-1529 CE, was an outspoken government official of the Ming Dynasty. He was perhaps the most influential teacher of the Neo-Confucian school of mind. Also known as the Idealists, Xi and Shui. Wang believed that the teaching of his predecessors in the Neo Confucian movement had lost all credibility when Yuan dynasty bureaucrats made it the official curriculum for civil service examinations. Reduced to a fixed set of questions and answers. Neo-Confucian ideas no longer required people to think independently. Wang's major work, Investigation into the Great Learning, commented on the ancient Confucian text, underscoring the need for active engagement with ideas. He condemned slavish adherence to rigid canons of ritual propriety. Wang argued for an understanding of Li as a living universal principle rather than a list of prescribed procedures and policies. He borrowed from Deist and Buddhist teachings, as earlier Neo-Confucians had done. Attempting to reinvigorate the tradition as a way of interpreting the whole of life and Wang reintroduced a metaphysical element by speaking of a true self and a heavenly principle. Above all, he insisted, one must not lose sight of the underlying challenge of human development and the struggle for moral improvement. Institutionalize what is meant to be a living tradition, Wang warned, and you create a giant fossil. What does the term dual Shinto mean? Dual, or Ryobu, two-sided, Shinto arose out of the early interaction between Shinto theology and Buddhist thinking newly imported from China. Some use the term Ryobu Shigo, dual compromise, to describe the resulting syncretism. Some accounts describe the developments this way. In 715 CE a Shinto shrine annexed a Buddhist temple. Twenty years later a smallpox epidemic created a crisis. To which the emperor responded by commissioning the colossal great Buddha, Debutsu, at Nara's Todeji Temple. At the same time, the ruler dispatched the Buddhist patriarch Gijitu. I.S.E. Shrine to seek the blessing of Amaterasu, the Shinto sun goddess. Gijitu secured a favorable oracle, and the next night the emperor had a dream in which Amaterasu identified herself as the Mahayana Buddha of Infinite Light, Varokana. This laid the groundwork for further identification of the various kami as alter egos of various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. In 750, an image of the Shinto war kami, Hachiman was transported from its shrine at USA on the island of Kyushu, just south of the main Japanese island. Honshu, to Todeji in Nara so that the kami might pay respects to the Debutsu. 
Hachiman thereafter remained in a special shrine at Todeji. Where he became the guardian kami of Todeji Temple. Thus did a Shinto kami come to protect the teachings of the Buddha. This account reflects an interpretation formulated during the 9th century by teachers of a new esoteric school of Buddhism called Shinjin. As always, this theological accommodation had its political implications and set the stage for many years of Buddhist growth and royal patronage. From then on until 1868, dual Shinto was the dominant form of Shinto. With the Meiji restoration of imperial power came increasing pressure from Shinto scholars to purge the tradition of all Chinese influences, including of course Buddhism and Confucianism both of which had by turns exerted considerable pull at court for many years. Is there such a thing as Confucian fundamentalism? Confucian scholars have devised a wide range of methods for interpreting the classical sources. Many of the central concepts in Confucian thought are simply too large and subtle to interpret literally. Take the notion of the mandate of heaven, for example. Dynasties have come and gone frequently in China's long history and many have interpreted dynastic decay as a sure indication that the emperor had lost his contact with heaven's will. That is an easy enough judgment to make in retrospect. But using the mandate theory as a criterion for deciding whether the people are justified in bringing down this regime now is a much more complicated matter. Some interpreters have chosen to apply the criteria of the classical sources directly to current events. They have their Christian counterparts, for example. In those who have discerned portents of the apocalypse in the world around them at various times in history. Some Confucian texts have lent themselves more readily to literal interpretation so much so that their prescriptions have become the very fabric of life for countless Chinese who have never set foot in a Confucian temple. Those are books like the Liji. With its detailed descriptions of ritualized relationships across the full spectrum of human activity. How do Confucians deal ritually with death and mourning? Confucian practices associated with funerals and ancestor veneration are of a piece with those of Daoism and CCT. In that the basic elements are common to most segments of traditional Chinese societies. Confucius and his disciples did have some specific thoughts on the matter, though. Disciple Sun Zi wrote that the feelings of loss and longing for a deceased person and the ritual expression of those feelings represented the height of human civilization and culture. In a way, one knows the humanity of others through the attachment they express for lost loved ones. Although Confucius himself declined to speculate about the experience of death or the condition of one who has died. He seems to have felt strongly that there were appropriate ritual and emotional responses. When asked whether he recommended the full three-year period of mourning. 
Confucius responded that if literati who lose loved ones were to dispense with the practice, they would risk the irrevocable loss of some of society's most important rituals. He added that if the questioner felt comfortable performing only a year's grieving, he might do so. After the questioner had left, however, the teacher commented how heartless such a person must be. Parents attend to their infants unceasingly for three years. The least their children can do is return the favor symbolically. One specific issue that has historically been very important for Confucianism and CIT is the question of monumental funereal architecture and special memorials for the great and powerful. Confucius and several of the tradition's later teachers have been remembered with fairly modest grave markers. Tombs of emperors, on the other hand, have often been grand, even extravagant, architectural works. At least one ruler even commissioned a virtual reconstruction of the royal residence underground. Complete with thousands of life-size terracotta soldiers to protect the imperial remains.